They do hunger games down there. They do adoption and they eat people. Welcome to Conspiracy Bingo, and for people checking this out on the podcast feed for the other shows this is going out on that are like, what the fuck is Conspiracy Bingo, check out our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Uh, we're going to get right into it here. Um, I have Noelle Cook. She is, I'm going to call her the star of uh, Page 75 Productions, The Conspiracist. How you doing? Uh-oh. I don't know any sound from you. Yeah, I don't know any sound from you. That's weird. Let's see. Uh, uh, let's try this again. Noel, how are you? I'm good. It still looks red, though. Oh. You can't hear me, can you? It's fine. No, it's fine. Actually, okay. crazy enough, you were saying uh, during our pre show conversation earlier that you're bad at technology, and that was my fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody on the podcast? This is, in fact, recorded live, and we're going to leave that fuck up in there. So, um, is, it, is it okay with you if I refer to you as the star of the conspiracists? He must, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I must. So uh, before we get started, just kind of tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, where they can find you on the internet. Uh, right now, um, you can find me on Blue Sky or on Twitter um, at ncookbouton, both both uh, platforms. Um, that's really my only internet presence at the moment. Cool. I'll put both of those links in the show notes. Uh, I got a chance to watch the movie uh, twice, actually. Because I watched it like a couple weeks ago and I was like, well, I should probably watch this again before I do this interview. Um, it wasn't what I expected. I'm going to be completely honest. And it was kind of refreshing because I'd seen 
I don't know, five or six other J6 documentaries, but you came at it from a completely different like perspective. First of all, yeah. I guess, how did you come to be in Washington, D.C. on January 6th? Um, I was a graduate student in 2020, um, and I had a research project lined up that got obliterated by the pandemic um, when there was no in-person research. Um, and so I sat around 2020 feeling fairly hopeless and uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And at the last minute on January 6th, I decided to drive down to D.C. I was living in Maryland at the time. Um, and I landed there at about two o'clock in the afternoon, right as the Capitol was being breached. Um, and I was on the east front of the Capitol, um, out in the lawn area, and I had a 400 zoom lens. And my purpose was to photograph what I thought was going to be a rally, which turned into something very different, um, and to try to find some sort of ethnographic anthropology project for my graduate thesis. Um, in the process, I ended up getting mostly pictures on the east front, um, and later that afternoon, walked around to the West Front um, and stood across the street from it and watched that, uh, still not really having any idea what was happening until I got home and turned on the television. Right, because like we, we covered January 6th here on the, the channel, and we actually watched them steal a door yeah. from the Capitol, which is crazy. I don't think anybody even noticed that. If anybody knows where the door is, please let us know. Um, I, I'll turn it into a nice coffee table. Um, yeah. But we probably were able to have like a better idea of what was going on because I was able to surf through like I was watching RSBN and I knew a bunch of the the, the kooks, right? I knew a bunch of like Deanna Ploss. I don't know if you've heard of Deanna Ploss. But... I had actually not paid close enough attention prior to January 6th. I just was watching social media. I really, I, I'll be honest with you, in 2016 to 17, I was part of the resist movement. Um, oh. I was a middle-aged liberal who, um, I, I didn't, I did not go as far as to do the blue wave in my profile. I will, I will take credit, <laughs> give myself credit for that at least. But I, I did, uh, took, take advantage of living so close to DC by signing up for Indivisible and their rapid response team that would send out a text message when they needed someone to get down to DC to deliver letters from constituents to various Congress people. Um, I went to all the marches, the women's march, the science march, the climate march, you name it, I was there thinking that was making some kind of difference. And, and in reality, it was just an Instagrammable moment of performativity for many of us, it turns out. Well, that's, that's funny you should bring that up. That's why I don't have a list of questions here, because I also think that for the mirror world image of that, right, is the people that were inside the Capitol taking selfies for Instagram. Right. 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 Uh, and that is how I ended up with this project. When I got home, turned on the television, realized what had happened. It was, a, it was very surreal, obviously, um, as the whole nation began to grapple with what we had seen and what it might mean. Um, and I ended up sitting there staring at my photographs for about two weeks. Um, and again, they were most of the East Front, which was people sitting on the steps. I don't have pictures of violence. I have pictures of people who had either been inside and come out or who had not gone inside yet, but everyone was just sitting there. And what really struck me about that was how many of the people in that, in those pictures looked like me, middle-aged women, um, white women who looked relatively middle-class. And one of the first things I did was attempt to rule out some of the economic insecurity argument. And so I used, uh, you know, Google Lens to try to out what people were wearing. Uh, I pretty quickly could say, yeah, we're not dealing with poor people here. There are a lot of middle class people sitting on that, those steps. And, and that's how I got interested in it is how these women who look like they could be sitting next to me at a PTA meeting were sitting next to men in, you know, with, with ballistics, uh, you know, ear protection and um, gas masks and various kinds of poles that look like weapons. Um, and, and, the, and, and then the, uh, surrealness of them sitting there taking selfies of themselves while right. people next to them are talking about hanging my pants. Right. I mean, no, I it's, literally heard that. It's, it's, it's so interesting that you brought up, cause I hadn't until right now thought about that, how, you know, um, in a lot of ways, basically I think like, honestly, like Obama and afterward, a lot of activism, um, at least when it was the normies doing what they thought was activism, a lot of it was about, oneself right about being a uh, having been there about putting on the pink hat or i mean i went to the science march we went and uh, a bunch of friends bands actually played at the science march here so we went kind of hang out there but it was still like you know we took pictures of the bands we were at the science march too and it's like and it's it's so interesting because i hadn't thought about that and that the exact like <clears throat> not the same thing but literally a mirror of the same thing happened inside the capitol 
And like one of my analyses was uh, good because had those people been organized and not taking selfies, things would have gone or could have gone very differently that day. And that's one way you can tell some of the organizers versus the, the normies who followed the crowd in. There were the, the, there were people who kept their faces covered for the duration of the day, or attempted to anyway. Um, but I think that was what was most amazing to me is to watch some of the videos that came out of that day with the women who actually were using that opportunity to advertise their small business. Um, we had a Beverly Hills. <laughs> eyelashes lady, right? Gina Bisignano, who was shouting from the tunnel uh, uh, to the, where she worked and where she lived uh, while she's standing in that tunnel. Uh, Jenna Ryan stood on the front steps saying she was going to sell your fucking house like she was going to storm the fucking Capitol. And you're like, wow, whoa, you know, uh, that was that was really surprising to see what a badge of honor that it was being um, used as that day. You know, um, and, and to watch social media in the days after, uh, you know, everyone I watched was like, yeah, I was there. It was the greatest day of my life. I'm going to do it again. Um, one of the women put together a whole montage of her pictures and let Apple, her iPhone, set it to music like you would like your birthday party. And then it played on social media with this very uplifting, you know, something you would have from a fun family vacation or a, a child's birthday party while there's these images of police officers being battered. Um, right. It was just so surreal. Um, didn't really know what to make of it. And eventually, after staring at my photographs for a few weeks, I thought, all right, I'm going to figure out. I mean, we know women have always been involved in these movements in one way or another. We would not have white supremacy if women weren't willing to uphold it, right? Uh, we wouldn't have patriarchy if women weren't willing to uphold that also. And we can go back all the way you know, turn of the century to, to white women's participation in these movements. Um, but what was different this time was that so many of these women were there without men. And that was kind of a difference from what we have seen in the past. We like to blame uh, men for dragging their women along to these, these kinds of violent events. And in many cases, women came with female friends. Some of them came with their adult children. Others came solo. And one woman who's in the film, Yvonne, came with her husband, but she was so excited to get to the front lines, she ditched him somewhere along the way and he never made it in. You know, and so like that that's kind so of, funny because that's like an inversion of what we might think would happen at something like right. this, where the, the husband would be like right. trying to drag the you know, the even right. not maybe not even an event like this where there's just all these kind of images from the past from cartoons or illustration of like the husband excited to do something and dragging his wife and kids along with him, like running. Right. Like I can see like the illustration in my head right now. And it's, it's really interesting. And, you know, now that you actually, uh, you know, now that you've uh, brought up your guests, I think um, that's, that's enough background. We come from this, we come to this in a very, very similar way outside of your focus on, you know, particularly middle-aged women, but we come, we come at all this well, from a very particular, from a very, very similar place. The women, middle-aged women piece was because I, I took the first 100 females arrested I wasn't participating in identifying people. I was looking at the statement of facts and the FBI affidavits to see what these people had done. And the first 100 women that were arrested, I charted them out and I put every data point I could think of to put. And at the end of that, the only pattern I saw at all was generational. Um, the vast majority of the first 100 women were Gen X women, my age. Um, uh, there were some younger boomers, but it was definitely that Gen X you know, 45 to 60, that was really predominant in that first series of arrests. And I thought that was fascinating too. Um, and so I'm sure you'll have more questions about that. So I'll wait to hear what you have to ask. Well, actually, if it's okay with you, I was going to run the trailer for your documentary sure. right now before we uh, get into the, the, the documentary itself. And I, uh, I imagine I didn't write anything down, but I will have good questions. I promise. Okay. <laughs> January 6th was a setup. Set I made national news <laughs> hanging out the window. So Talking more right. importantly is that test, test. being stripped of So I'm here with Yvonne at Freedom Corner. You were just convicted for January 6th. And I was just sentenced. It does feel like the world's going slightly mad. Right? Right, but that it's just darkness being exposed. So we've never been to the moon, they're lying. Um we've never been to the moon. Not through traveling through space. 
Yeah, they control the weather. They, they modify mm -hmm. heart. There's a set. Who care controls the weather? The elite. And I'm like, what the heck? So I go, and this is before I knew about McDonald's too. I got myself an Egg McMuffin. <laughs> what about McDonald's? They oh, use human meat. Use human meat. Really? Yes. Yeah. So when you're terrified, your adrenaline glands pump adrenaline into your blood and um, they drink the blood of terrified people and that is what keeps them younger and it also... And who drinks the blood of terror? These elite pedophiles. My head's exploding. I hope that your documentary comes out in time, but be, to be truth, I think the shift will become before then and maybe this trip is just meant to help you raise your consciousness. How exhausted are you? Physically or mentally? <laughs> I think the mental exhaustion just comes from the realization of just how far gone so many people in this country are, not just this country, globally. That was, a, that was a great trailer, and there's some memorable moments in there, but I don't want to jump too far ahead. <laughs> so, my, I guess the first question is, how did you come to know uh, Yvonne, the, the woman you spent, I think, the, the most, other than your wonderful producer liz of course the person you spend yeah. the most time with uh, on the yeah. documentary or during the at least during the part of the documentary on screen she's a director and the editor and she is wonderful she's in london um well how i got to make them is as i said i spent the whole first year after january 6 researching on paper i used every public record available uh, court documents uh, in their home from their hometowns newspapers um middle-aged women are not great with privacy controls in social media so it's really easy to go back and look over time um you know you can watch the progression if you go back to 2012 and move forward and so i was starting to learn a lot about them just through social media and court records and papers um what i did is my research account i made a research account and i used facebook almost exclusively and joined groups and eventually i was in groups with various jan six women and I had not intended to make contact with any of them necessarily at first, but I ended up, Yvonne's journey went down so many rabbit holes, I got lost. I didn't know where I was going. So I ended up messaging her to ask her some questions about uh, what a star seed meant to her and what light worker meant to her. Because my purpose was to understand what I was seeing and what it meant to them um, and without trying to push back or judge, just to understand. And so, I, I got taken down so many rabbit holes, I had to eventually ask some questions. Tammy was a little different. Um, I had learned enough about Tammy on paper to know that she had no one in her life that she could depend on. And so when her co-defendant uh, committed suicide in July of 22, uh, they were scheduled for sentencing in September, and he committed suicide in July. I just had this feeling like I needed to reach out through Facebook Messenger and on one of our groups and just say, hey, how are you handling this? Um, and we started talking uh, through Messenger for about a year. Uh, we, we exchanged messages back and forth. Um, I'll show, I mean, I'm saying we talked for a year, but we actually, for two months, we were doing that pretty intensely. And, and then her own child committed suicide in September of 22. She had a trans daughter who was 32 years old and was in the county prison, and she committed suicide. Uh, and that's when everything kind of changed. Um, the academic piece kind of went out the window. You got too um, close to I, the story. Yeah, I got too close. I started helping her find resources to try to help her. You can't um, research yourself. And you were now part right. of the thing you were looking into. I made myself a character of the story. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I can, you know, I can see where that, that happened. You know, I, I was, I've been chasing down this. I was chasing down this story for a better part of a year. And I, there were a lot of ways in which. I kind of lost myself as a, a journalist yeah. in the story. I yeah. ended up not making myself a character until I published my last article on it. Right. I was like, well, I got to publish this before I become a character in this story. Right. But you know, that, that's a different even standard even too. To out of it, but it didn't work. <laughs> it's a totally different standard too. I mean, I'm the editor, publisher, owner of my blog versus, you know, you were trying to work within the academic structure. So right. the, 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 the guardrails are much, uh, tighter, stronger, and, you know, for good reason. Right. Exactly. Was it, did, were you, were you upset in a way, or did you feel like you had lost something in, in not being able to pursue the academic work that you were doing? Uh, no, because there were other factors that went into it as well, which is how I ended up being able to get to know these women, because as middle-aged women, 
middle-aged white women um, who were the same age, we had more in common than I had realized or wanted to admit even, right, with our own life experiences. And so almost all of our conversations centered around our lives. We, to believe, believe it or not, I never had to discuss politics. Over time, uh, if, you were, if you were self-aware enough, Tammy was able to figure out that I was not her. It took Yvonne that road trip to determine that I was not like her. Uh, but because I wasn't pushing back or attacking them or fighting with them about their beliefs, they just assumed I was okay with all of it, which is what I found as a middle-aged white woman. I could travel freely through all of these spaces. I was at the trucker convoys. I was at the border convoys. I, I, I can go where I want because I, they just assume I'm one of, I, I believe the same things as they do if I'm not being combative. Um, and so I guess that was the beauty of ethnography is the purpose of ethnography is to observe and to learn what something means to that culture. Um, so I was a little bit shielded from having to, to say a whole lot about my own beliefs because no one ever asked either. Right. That's, you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I think about it. Nobody ever really asks you what you believe, no matter who you are. No, they don't. If they, they no. find out when their own beliefs maybe come up or some issue comes up and you start talking right. about that, but people don't tend to be like, Hey, uh, you know, you're at a cocktail party. Hey, what are your politics? I think at a cocktail party, you probably assume everybody's politics are like yours right. or, or whatever. And I just think that's, I think we, I think we have to do that. Otherwise we're just going to go around looking for conflict and nobody's going to make any fucking friends. Right. Yeah, and that's kind of how I, this whole thing um, evolved. And I grappled and struggled a lot with this part of it uh, by about 23. It was very confusing to me because I was caring about these people. And I had not planned to do that. And uh, yeah, you, but you, you, when you get to know someone as a human first and you don't start talking political beliefs. And again, I got lucky because the women that I was following closely weren't overt racist. Is there racism there? Absolutely. But they weren't overt about it. Um, they, they might even tell you that they're not. What's that? They might even tell you that they don't. Well, they would any. tell me that they're not 100%. Uh, Tammy has biracial grandchildren. Um, her her daughter has children with a black man, and she adores them. And if, uh, but it doesn't stop her from sharing racist memes online. Um, well, um, sometimes too, the you know the the people making the uh, racist propaganda are clever. They know that some of the normies aren't going to necessarily see what they're see what's yeah. In the thing. Some of these are pretty overt, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, that, that, I, mean, I didn't some of know. Possible deniability, sure. But there's other stuff. Nah, nah. It's a choice yeah. to share it. So <clears throat> you spent the most time with, with, uh, Noel. Um, why did you, no, you mean uh, Yvonne. um, yeah, oh, you're Noel. I'm sorry. I'm Noel. Yeah. We sound alike <laughs> and we look alike. But yeah, we're not all middle-aged white ladies look that look the same. They have the same fucking That's name. Exactly right. That's how I was able to travel freely. <laughs> yeah, I even got you two confused. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, um, it's okay. How did you decide to go on the road trip with Yvonne? Um, I've been talking to Yvonne since November of 21, and she told me her entire life story. Uh, both women encouraged me to tell her stories in the book I'm writing. Um, uh, Yvonne got a hold of me sometime in the summer of. Um, so it was before her sentencing. I went to her trial, first of all, in March of 23, um, which, she shot, which she saw as an act of friendship, uh, which, again, I had to grapple with that notion. You know, are we friends? Is that what we are? And what does a friendship mean? What does friend mean? Um, but I went to her trial, and then I went to her sentencing, and I was going to go to her sentencing. It was postponed from June until September. Sometime that summer, she called me and said um, that the court was going to provide her transportation to D.C., but she was on her way on her own to get home. And she quit her job in 2020 uh, during the pandemic because she decided that working for the system made her a complacent slave. So she quit paying her mortgage. She quit her job. She quit registering her cars, started dabbling in sovereign citizen language, not the actual actions and beliefs and ideology. But as you know, and have been watched this, is this was just like this giant smorgasbord of belief systems that all converged. Um, every presence online during the pandemic saw the perfect opportunity to recruit people um, into QAnon 
uh, we see like a bond started out with love is one during the pandemic because she found their colloidal silver ads on Instagram as a possible way of warding off COVID through them and their hashtags they began using in the early stages of the pandemic. She found QAnon. I had always assumed it would be the opposite, but it wasn't. Uh, Tammy just knew there was a bus going to DC and it was an opportunity to meet people because she was lonely. And uh, she continued to go to Trump rallies throughout the last few years. But it was almost never, I never heard her say, I can't wait to hear President Trump speak. It was always, I can't wait to meet my Telegram fam. Right. Or like when, when she said, uh, even when uh, Tammy uh, uh, talked about how she had to go to jail, she talked about how right. she went, she was going there. She liked like going to meet people. Right. If, if, and right. and uh, Yvonne, Yvonne said something very similar, actually, yeah. about how she was going to, you know, as a, I think she was in the context of maybe her being a star seed, how she was going to get to meet all these souls and touch all these right. souls. Help awaken them. Yeah. And yes. help, and help, help awaken them because of the, it's this evangelical. So what, do you remember what the context was when you found out that she was, she could get to DC, but not back? Did you, were you just like, well, hell, I'll give you a ride. No, she said uh, her son had just moved back home from Ohio, had left his car in Ohio. It needed to be driven back to Idaho. And so she asked me if I would be willing to drive across, drive, get, get, get to Ohio with her and drive that car across country. Liz and I had already been planning to go film, t- <clears throat> film Tammy after Yvonne's sentencing. Um, and so I said to Liz, you up for this? So I say yes. And she said, yep. Yeah. And we went to Yvonne's sentencing. We still hadn't even gotten, we hadn't asked Yvonne to be in the film yet, but I knew Yvonne pretty well by then. And I knew that once she saw what we were doing, she'd want to participate in it, which is exactly what happened. She showed up at the Capitol after her sentencing and asked to sign the waiver so she could be in the film. Uh, and then she went with us to, to Tammy's and they had never met before. They didn't even know each other from online. And yet they were able to finish each other's sentences uh, from the moment they met. And it was so interesting to watch that happen and to, to see all these things I had observed online that I had thought I understood. And then to watch it actually play out in real time was kind of amazing. Um, and that's how that happened. And then we stopped and met a couple other people that Yvonne knew from online along the way. So you had, you know, we were talking about Tammy and I, I, one of, one of my favorite moments yeah. of, of Tammy is this, uh, this particular clip I'm going to play next yeah. here. It's about McDonald's and it was in the trailer, but it was, I don't know. I guess life is better when you don't know about McDonald's. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be, we'll be right back. This clip's only 30 seconds. Yeah. And there's no bus there. And I'm like, what the heck? So I go, and this is before I knew about McDonald's, too. I got myself an Egg McMuffin. <laughs> what about McDonald's? They oh, use human meat. use human meat. Really? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they literally have a, a club in L.A. that's called the Cannibal Club that they eat human meat. Ooh, I'm a DJ. I'll play at the Cannibal Club. So the thing about <laughs> Tammy that I didn't realize until just now is she reminds us of somebody that we had... Um, Got a bit of a conflict with. Um, here's a here's a clip from her. She said, "They do Hunger Games down there. They do adoption, and they eat people." And Tammy like reminds me a little bit of this lady Betty Washam. Well, luckily enough, my co-host uh, Ashley was able to like pull this lady back from the brink. Oh, good. Uh, uh, again, we got we stopped covering her again because we got as we talked about too close, right? But hey. we don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on with this lady, but she's not like talking about like the tunnels under, under Hollywood or whatever anymore. So, but yeah, well, mine are <laughs> what, um, I know that you, you know, we had said that, uh, you know, you had said that, uh, Tammy and Yvonne were uh, pretty similar in finishing other sentence, each other's sentences, but what were maybe the differences you, you saw between the, the two women that you met? What was interesting is they both came in from the same space, right? They were both. Uh, follower in QAnon. Um, they both believed the election had been stolen, um, went to Jan 6. What I really thought was interesting is as I was studying them over time, by 22, I start seeing words I'd never seen like cryon, uh, K-R-Y-O-N. And when you see things more than once, you can look them up and see what they mean. And I start to get dragged into um, the conspirituality realm now. And I see these two women who have entered 
this movement for very different reasons. Yvonne wants to be a healer. She wants to be a teacher. She wants to be a leader. Tammy wants to be a participant. She wants to belong and she wants to create identity for herself. And so they both are coming in for different reasons that end up converging into the same conspirituality space. Both of them had been raised evangelical. One of them was raised Catholic, one was raised evangelical. Yvonne had ditched the church in 2020 when they closed their doors to in-person gatherings because she decided, again, this was another system that was a man-made system designed to control us. And she went online and found conspirituality and started believing in ascended masters and uh, that God was a woman based on Amy Carlson uh, with Love is One. Um, and so they both came in for different purposes and landed in the same space, which I thought was really fascinating. And then once I started to learn what the, you know, when I see the word I am in all caps, followed by a name, I start to see that must mean something too. <laughs> and so I've kind of learned this stuff by following these women, like a child with their parents, right? I'd let them take me where they were going. Um, and then I had to learn about it, um, which is why I ended up at the conscious life expo in LA in 23 to try to understand Yvonne better. Um, and that's where I was able to see, uh, I got the vision of a, like a trade show that, that this whole online ecosystem was like a trade show where you walk into the hall and everyone's got a booth and you take the swag from each table, dump it out, keep what you want, throw the rest, rest away. And pretty soon you have these conspiracists using dabbling in some sovereign citizen language, very anti-government sentiments. Um, maybe now they're anti-vax, uh, and you can, and when you go to something like Conscious Life Expo, which is the longest running New Age festival in the country, um, and I look back over the last 20 some years at who their guests were, and it used to always be the normal, typical UFO, astrology stuff. And then they start getting more political. Like the year I went in 23, Mickey Willis was showing Plandemic 3. Dell Big Tree, there was a line wrapping through the whole trade show marketplace to get in to see him. You know, in 24, now we've got Del Big Tree still, but now Lee Dundas is there, Scientologist. Mm, that's that's so weird because we, in California. we knew who Lee Dundas was before any of this because we've been right. covering the cult of Scientology for like a decade. So we knew that she was uh, uh, their lawyer. And <clears throat> I don't know if I was like somebody put on Twitter, they're like, hey, look at the, watch this person at the Orange County uh, board, uh, uh, board of Supervisors meeting. I'm mm -hmm. like, that lady worships a space alien. Yeah. I'm like, I knew who that is. It's, yeah. it, it's so weird. We have a thing here and somebody mentioned it in the chat. It's maybe not the most articulate way to describe it. We, we call it grand unified potato theory. where like all this dumb stuff is becoming the same dumb thing. Yeah. Like yeah. you had mentioned about the conscious life expo, like you were saying before, you know, maybe if they were going to get a big name before it would have been like Deepak Chopra or yeah. maybe the, the yeah, person who did a movie said. like the secret or something right. like that. But now if they get a big name, you're talking like, you know, highly like political figures, Del Big Tree, RK right. Jr. Right. These people who they're RK not only, they're, they're, yet. <laughs> they're not, they're not just like this kind of spiritual crystal mm -hmm. healing energy. They also bring something more charged and I, like more dangerous with them. Well, I went and heard Mickey Willis's talk, you know, you have to, and again, let's talk about the economic insecurity piece, which is just completely fabrication to go to conscious life expo is 95 bucks a day. It's a three day fair. Um, that if you're staying overnight, way more than Furcon. Furcon's, only, Furcon's only 40 bucks a day. And I'm not even <laughs> no, a furry. It's like like 90 something. <laughs> and you know, then there's hotels and, and but if you want to, there's all the free workshops, but if you want to hear the name speakers, that's another $60 ticket. So I really hate giving the money, but I bought the ticket to hear Mickey Willis. And it was just like every other group online is like, what are you willing to live and die for? You know, yeah. you know kids. And you know, that's, that's again, the gender path I was looking at to see how are all of these middle-aged women being sucked in and it's, you throw in children and now there's justification for anything you do. Right. You you got, like, like I also listen, like, strangely enough, this crosses like one of the things I don't, we don't do a lot of it. We have a tech podcast, but I listen to a lot of, uh, uh, podcasts about like tech technology and culture and what they one of the things they talk about on there is like hey anytime you see any uh internet regulation that's uh you know supposed to help the children you better take a close look at that because there's you know maybe and it's not the same you know it's it's to take away our ability to speak and share and it's you know bad for sex workers and all that usually but and you know anytime anybody's like holding out like 
just a children as a concept in front of you as to why you should uh, come along with them. You, it's sad, but you need to be pretty skeptical. Well, I think that's what the pandemic did too, as it kind of hit all the spheres of you know womanhood, of education, children, health, nutrition. All of those things became a became an issue, which I think is one of the reasons we have so many middle aged women, because also middle aged women, these Gen X women, have a lot more time online. They're spending more time already online. Many of them are caregivers still for children, kids coming home from college again to be children again, um, aging parents. Um, I think that that is one way so many of these women got sucked in and women are invisible once you're middle-aged, you know, and all of a sudden now you have this purpose. You have this, this new uh, feeling that you can be a hero by sharing new information about whatever, whatever the cabal is doing next. Right. Um, and that was a really a big motivator for participation for so many of these women is they could all just say, gotta do it for the kids. Right. And we, one of the things like I, you know, we, we talk about conspiracy theories and like people who make a lot of false claims here, but we're not spending a lot of time debunking it. We're more in that space that you're in, but just not, not maybe necessarily focused in the same way, but it's about you have, you remember when you were a kid, I know something you don't know. It's that feeling, but there's also this feeling of community too. Cause as we get older, it's just harder oh, to yeah. make new friends. It's Absolutely. just straight up harder to make new friends, especially yep. with and if you think about this, if you're spending more time online, maybe during the pandemic, you're stuck inside anyway. I don't know. Maybe you lose touch with some of your friends because you start believing some weird stuff and they're stressed out yep. and they get mad at you. Now you're more isolated. And and so you get well, you get this yeah. this reinforcement of that what you believe is true. You probably get love bombed by some of these communities. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. then, then these are your friends now, except you've oh, probably never met most of them. And they, yep. you know, they, you think. It's it's weird that parasocial relationships are weird because there are ways in which um, there are ways in which like online people do form community. Like, you know, we think mm -hmm. about like, the, you know, I don't think gay marriage happens without the Internet or doesn't happen as quickly because all the gay people online were like, wait a minute. There's a there's a, there's actually kind of a lot of wait. Whoa. We, whoa, uh, at least the ones of us are visible have, are white and have money. Hey, we should have political power, you know, so mm -hmm. some sometimes it's good. But, the you know, the flip side of it is it, it just a. Uh, it just allows for people who are like isolated to, you know, go down a rabbit hole because they've been accepted by this group of people. Right. Which is how, which is one of the ways I identified with some of these women, right? Which is how we had conversations because once your children are grown, like most of my adult friends, either if they weren't retained from you know, one of my younger days, they were people I met when my children were small. And we would hang out. But by high school, our kids all split off going different places. Parents drift apart. And then one day your kids go to college and your friends are kind of gone. And you have to create new community. And we don't have many options for that offline um, unless you are going to a church. But even that uh, attendance in actual physical churches has been waiting for years. Right. Um, what is it? We call it the third place, right? The work home right. in the third place. Yeah. And yeah, we're running out of third place. places that aren't either churches or like places where you have to spend money. And right, like, exactly. there's nothing wrong with going to a place and spending money at a local business, but that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be the cost of entry to make a new friend. And it's, it's, it's terrible. And that was, what was interesting this year in 24, I went to the conscious life expo again. So two years in a row and it felt like a high school reunion when I watched people in the hallways greet the first time I didn't really know again, just kind of get my bearings. Second time I'm like, Oh, okay. I see how this works now. And this is like an annual, like you come, this is your, your family. You get to come and reunite with it once a year. Um, and then there's all of these people willing to exploit that. And, you know, I, I watched many of them continue to radicalize. I'd love to say that I had some sort of impact on um, either one of these women to get them out of conspiracies, but I did not because I cannot replace a sense of identity or community for them. I'm one person. Um, all I've been used for is um, advice and assistance for some practical things, but I can't replace what they get out of the conspiracy communities. So the, the other thing that I, <clears throat> that you'd brought up about like uh, it's a you're you're going after some like you're not just going after a belief like it's you're not you're not arguing about like what to get on a pizza here right you're not like you, you could you could compromise on a pizza but you're after it, uh, you know uh sausage and mushroom pizza is not that core to anybody's identity it does right. not replace community for anybody right. we could even get real controversial and go pineapple on pizza right 
but it, it just yeah, doesn't have a problem. <laughs> right. Right. Well, maybe it is part of your identity, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but this, yeah, these kinds of things like are, it, there's a real difference between types of belief, right? There's kinds of beliefs that are like core to someone's identity. And then there's just like, like I have, I have a belief that I like to, I believe that I should have a brand new laptop every three years, right? That's right. not really core to my identity until I'm on the train and my battery dies. Uh, right. But it's, it's so I, I, you know, I see a lot of debunkers and I kind of used to be this guy cause I was into like YouTube, like skepticism. I'm sure right. you probably remember you know, the actually guy kind of think I kind of did that, but that's, that's fucking yeah. useless. It's fucking useless. Right. It really yeah. is. It, it is you, you, and I mean, making fun of making fun of people is useless and, but, but what the, the the what I wanted to do here, and I, it's it's hard to do this, right? Because of the way these scenarios are structured, is it's okay to go after the propagandists, but the propagandized yeah. are victims. But the the way these things are structured, it's almost like an MLM, where as soon as yeah. you get involved and you start being really a, a integral part of a Facebook group, you might start your own, or you might start your own Telegram, and now you have your own sort of downline or whatever, so to speak, and now you're propagandizing a smaller group maybe than the one you came out of and it just gets so gets so fuzzy as to who's the perpetrator and who's being who's being taken advantage of yes yep like as well. yvonne for example she's in that that's that middle space right where she had a big following or i don't know i don't know how big her she had a following on social media who were watching her videos TikTok, yeah or yeah, TikTok. Yeah. So, TikTok. so then you like it's at that point she's you know, it's like being stuck in the middle of the layer cake kind of where she's getting propagandized from above. And I don't like in the above and below isn't, but she, yeah, she's getting propagandized from fewer people above her and then spreading it maybe to more people below her. And it's like, well, you know, are you the, are you the propagandized or are you the propagandist here? And it, it can, you, you, with, with her, I, she's right in the middle. I, I don't know what you, you flip a coin, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And, and again, this is where no, not this isn't a one size fits all thing. It's a very hard thing to set. When I first started this, there was very little research about female conspiracists. Almost all of the research done on conspiracies were done through a masculine lens. Um, there wasn't a lot for me to follow here, and I and I didn't I don't do this on my own, so I didn't know in advance. Um, and so what I really have learned is. So many of these women, and why I've only got settled on the two in the film is because many of them did what you said. They saw an opportunity to become influencers themselves. And so once you do that, there's not a lot to learn from you anymore because I don't know where your beliefs start and stop. What, you know, what's for attention and what's because you actually believe it. With Yvonne, she never monetized herself. She never tried to um, become an influencer. For Yvonne, it was true. She really, truly wanted to help people. She really, truly did. And she got so radicalized. And again, she's one of those people who probably has one of those personalities that the research is coming out now. Now the academics have done the research, it's gone through the peer review, it's starting to be published in 23, 24. And, you know, the academics are finding these individual characteristics of what a conspiracist looks like. And when you piece them all together, I can see the picture. And not everybody's coming with all of them. Someone comes from this space, this space, this space. There's different paths, but they all go into the same pool. And, you know, Tammy's path was very different from Yvonne's. Every identity Yvonne's ever had, when she joined the Marines in the late 80s as a woman, she rose to the top, and in 16 years, she was a drill instructor. And she has to be a leader. When she was dishonorably discharged from the Marines, she ended up finding evangelicalism almost immediately and didn't just, wasn't just happy sitting in the pews. She had to become like a youth group leader because she had a heart for teens. Um, so she always has to rise to that top, but she did the same thing in the conspirituality realm. She um, found a shaman on Mount Shasta in 2021. On Everything comes world. back to Mount Shasta. Yeah. She went to Bubble well, Love is One. She learned about Mount Shasta in 2020 prior to Amy Carlson's death. Um, and then in 21, after Amy Carlson's death, she went for eight, eight, uh, for August 8th, the Lionsgate portal. And that is where she met um, a white woman who uh, was a shaman, uh, who somehow, this woman who had quit her job, lost her house, Yvonne, is coming up with $2,200 to pay this woman to give her spiritual warrior training um, for seven months at the tune of like $2,200. And it wasn't until the, uh, the Roe versus Wade was overturned 
that Avon decided she had outgrown this shaman woman because that group was all pretty appalled at that decision, which surprised me, but, but also made me happy to know that they actually had something that I would agree with. But Avon found that so appalling that she realized she had ascended higher now than her than her, her guru, right? Her her mentor. And and that's when she realized, ah, that's why I was at J6, is because I am ascending. My third eye is about to open. And she told me when your third eye is about to open, that means you're gonna help save humanity and personal through personal sacrifice, which can mean a whole lot of things, right? Um, and that's what she decided about prison. Because she didn't think she was ever going up until the day she actually went. She kept thinking something would happen to prevent her from going, but, but she did. Some didn't version have to of go. the storm is coming was what I was hearing right. from her. Right. Always. But it was that way with everything. I'm not going to trial. Sentencing's not gonna happen. I'm not going to jail. She's been in jail now for a year or um, so I guess. 13 months now um and it really hasn't changed anything she's been offline for a solid year her beliefs are the same because all she has to do now is ask people who and say hey i want to send you some books what do you want she orders the dolores cannon books right um she knows enough now to know what titles to ask for to keep it going and um she decided yeah she's in prison because there's going to be souls in there that need to be awakened and she's going to be the teacher to do it and she means uh, she wants to help. She really does. Yeah, I don't know. Prison, prison's not a nice environment. I hope she's okay in there because she could start talking that mess to the wrong person, and the, the person's mm -hmm. like got a long sentence and doesn't want to hear this enlightened <laughs> crap. And you know, but, but she's actually was it, um, she was selected for what they call the RDAP program, which is kind of the Cadillac of federal prison system programs. It's a recover, it's a addiction recovery program. But Yvonne doesn't have substance abuse issues. So I, I asked her sister, well, what, how did she get put in that program if she's not using drugs or alcohol? And the sister said, I, that was a good question. She asked the program director that herself, and they just said, there are other kinds of addictions. But they wouldn't elaborate. Right, because uh, so, they didn't, they, because, well, they probably, as the, pure, the prison system, they can't say that these conspiratorial beliefs are like a like a or like a like an addiction because some of it right. like revolves around religion and religious freedom and you don't want to get caught right. out saying something something I don't, like that they might be uh, they might be recognizing internet addiction i don't know yeah. i would have to ask yvonne and i haven't had a chance to ask her about that part yet well that, that's but, um, good for her if she's in a less intense environment because well they're be a like, block they they they're a whole cell block together um but she but that program if you are successful and complete it you get a, a, up to a year shaved off your sentence um, she was sentenced for 30 months. She's been in for 13 and she's due to come home in January because she is successfully completing that program. We have, Steph, we have so Steph in chat saying that conspiracy theories are 100% an addiction. And I, I think for many people, they do, oh, yeah. it does function. The, the dopamine hits and all that, it does function uh, a lot that way. And I've had Steph on uh, in the studio a couple of times. That's, that's how we met. Uh, yeah. By the way, I didn't even thank Steph for introducing us. This is, this Steph is cool. wonderful. This is cool. We're gonna. I think we're gonna be long time internet pals because we're. Yeah, Steph has been a real help to me as well in understanding this and what it looks like on the other side for somebody in conspiracy who had been in conspiracy so deeply, and it's been really refreshing to. Get were you to ever know. dabbling in kind of conspiratorial beliefs? Yeah. No, it was interesting because now that all the research is coming out, I'm like, it's a. I I don't have any. I've never ever believed in conspiracies, and I don't. I, I'm a natural skeptic. I think. Um, so but that's, I, isn't that I, funny? Because no. like a lot of the people that believe in chemtrails will tell you that they got there by themselves being a natural skeptic, right? Right. That's what I'm saying. A lot of the research that's coming out describes me. Some of the personality traits. The religious folks say there, but for the grace of God, go I. I mean, I'm I'm not religious myself, but that's a really good good statement because a couple different sets of circumstances, right? And maybe maybe it's us. It, and I keep thinking about that. Is like what what why didn't I go down that? path and there's some differences some distinct differences in my life compared to these women's lives i might have some ptsd from circumstantial events in my life but i don't have cptsd i don't have a series of complex traumas throughout my entire lifetime whereas most of the women i've talked to who are true believers have and there's there's this ability to dissociate in some ways that i don't have um and I don't know why that is. I also don't have a, a religious background, and I don't know if maybe that has something to come to do with it. And again, it's hard to even try to define it that way because I truly believe everyone comes from a different place into this space, and then they they amp each other up, and it grows and grows and grows. 
you know, and maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you just have, I think that people don't think about, think about this enough, but like it's uh, friends, family, uh, community interests, like, like no matter where I've moved or whatever, uh, around the Bay area, I've always made sure to see my parents as often as right. I can hang out with my sister, my brother-in-law, keep in touch with friends, like these kinds of like, and I've been fortunate that that's been something I've been able to do. Right. And I, I did start to do the nine 11 thing a little bit, right. um, but it was funny cause, um, I, you know, I brought it up to my parents and my dad's like, do you know how long I've been like a manager? Do you know, do you know how hard it is to get people to just not tell people stuff they're not supposed to tell people? Exactly. He's, like, he's like, do you know, do you, he's like, think, just think about this for a while. He didn't even argue with me or whatever. He was like, just think about this for a while. He's like, you're a, He's like, you work with like, you, he's like, you work with computers. The computer, the computer only does what you tell it to. He's like, the, the, the people aren't like that. He's like, the, and he's like, do you know how many moving parts this would have if it was a cover up? Right. And then that just, it didn't not right away, but it wasn't long. Right. It wasn't like he had to plant right. the seed. It was more like he had half the tree already and just stuck it in the ground, you know? Right. Which I think is something interesting to look at because you know, when you look when you look at something like that, you, you distrust your government that much that you think that would actually be some kind of cover up that the government was involved in, which Yvonne actually believes too. Yeah, she, she joined said the Marines. She said it like matter of fact, almost like as an aside. Yeah, she said uh, I was a drill instructor during uh, 9-11 and I was training Marines who came in specifically because of 9-11 little did they know their government did it is what she says and then but she like, and, wanted to move on too she like that wasn't even a like a thing a thing to talk about or whatever do you know what i'm saying yeah. it was like yeah. it was like it was like nice weather today almost the way she exactly. said it it's just a given and right. we all don't we all believe that is pretty much how she thinks right um but you have to look at what what it why are people so willing to believe the government's after them and and you start to look at these systems that have failed across the board in various ways for t different people um when it becomes personal i think is when people start to look for reasons it happened and it's easy to start to make up stories to tell yourself um, which is, you know, how Yvonne got into conspiracies when the church closed during COVID. It couldn't just simply be that there was a global pandemic and that people needed to stay separated so that we all weren't dying at the same time. And so things closed. It had to be a nefarious plot because this man-made institution, and, and you can see it in the film, there's a couple of times where when Liz, it was great to have Liz along because she didn't know a lot of this stuff. And so she, no, I loved her because she was kind of like deadpan and like exactly. And you could she tell was she was surprised exactly. because you could spot a little bit of like I don't know. I wouldn't call it sarcasm. I don't know. I think she's British too. They have they have a way yes, about yes, them. They have a way. Yes, you, could, dry, you, could, yeah. you could spot that she was like a little incredulous, but she was right. always like just super kind of flat. And yeah. it was very interesting listening to her talk to Yvonne. That for yes, and that's part. one reason Yvonne never stopped talking and explaining conspiracies because she had a, a fresh mind there to, to mold. And so driving in that car, quite tedious, let me tell you. No, the, one of the things that struck me was when you, I, I think it was when she went to pick up, after she had picked up her son's car, you and, um, you and uh, Liz Smith had, you know, note, like noted that this was the first time that you had been like yes. separated from her and there wasn't <clears throat> you didn't have to say it but the the audience knows that you that you had were like exasperated by her in some way that it, maybe maybe not exasperated because you knew exhausted. you were getting in, exhausted yeah it's tiring it's and it, it, it doesn't exhausted. have to be conspiracies right have you ever you ever you ever talked to anybody who just wants to talk about one thing all the time yes. and they're you know and it's it's like one thing when it's your kid and they just got like a new video game console or whatever. And they want to tell you about it. You're like, well, I did buy you that thing after all. <laughs> it's a little bit different when it's an adult and all they want, like they know you're not into sports and they want to talk to you about sports all the time, or they know that you're not, I don't know that you're not a big drinker and they just want to tell you all their drinking stories. It could be any number of things, you know, but it wasn't that self-serving for Yvonne. She's just trying to awaken us. She well, was trying to provide us that, service. But I don't think that the people that are like want to tell you about sports or whatever either. I don't think it's self serving for them. I think it's just what they know. Right. That's true too. Yes. Or maybe they want you they do want you to get into sports, but like I don't know, getting into the local basketball team. There's nothing wrong with that. Plenty plenty of people get to watch a basketball game. And that's what Yvonne says to me in the car. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a call from you one day where you say, Aha, I get it. You know, because no, I heard she that says too. To me, I think you admire me and wanna be like me. 
So yeah, it was it's because it's it's for a lot of people it becomes especially it's funny that you mentioned she came from an evangelical church because now she's she was evangelizing to you and to I think to a I don't think it was shown as much in the film but I think she knew maybe the the, the you knew kind of knew the background of this but to Liz it seemed like she definitely wanted to evangelize to Liz oh, totally. and yeah. <clears throat> Tammy didn't seem so interested in evangelizing nope. to 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 you she she told you what she believed, but it was very different. She didn't seem very different. She didn't seem like desperate isn't the right word, but like cling to the idea that you might one day believe what she believes. No, she just wants me to be, to be her friend. Right. She wants well, me to accept her and like her and, and to be her friend. Well, if there's, if there's anybody in the world that needs a, 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 a normie friend, it's Tammy. Yes, it is. Um, and you know what? Uh, it works. Because when we're talking normal stuff, we're talking about what middle-aged women talk about, that our kids are pain in the asses, or that, you know, some ex-husband thing, or whatever, right? Um, and which is why I was able to do this for so long, because we could have conversations that made sense to me. Um, and so that, I think, has been interesting, that even people so very, very different, not just politically, but can, who believe in these really far-out conspiracies, that I was still able to find some common ground with them, some commonality, and uh, I've got a cold, if you can't hear it. Sorry about that. It's all right. Um, and I thought, you know, that was interesting to me that I was able to do this for as long as I did. And it was, and I authentically do care about what happens to the lives at this point. I, mean, I don't even um, know them and I don't, I don't wish them ill. I can't say that I, yeah. you know, that's, I haven't met them, but I certainly don't, you know, I don't think that lady, she, you know, she, I don't, I thought the sentence was harsh. I thought, other people, I saw lower sentences. I know she pissed the judge off. Like oh, I, that's I know, what happened. Yeah, she yeah, yeah. she gave a forty-five minute speech at her sentencing and told the judge she was part of a clown court well, no, and no, no, didn't I recognize the that. jurisdiction. And that's a, like I you said some sovsits stuff right. where the sovsits think they're going to go in there and give the judge what for. It's not the same exactly, yeah. but it's sort of one of it's, it's the part of the idea. mentality. She was one of the few women. The government asked for thirty-three months. Most women were getting at least 50% of that shaved off by, when the judge actually came down. Most women who had done what Yvonne did would probably have gotten somewhere between 30 and 90 days, possibly, maybe less. Um, because she Maybe for some of that, that, then that would have been time served then, right? Um, she didn't ever go. She oh, was never held in pretrial oh, detention. Fed, yeah, the Fed is way more, Feds are way more likely to let you out on pretrial than your... They, local. all of these women... With the exception, Rachel Powell, who I did not feel, we did not ask to film. That was a whole different, I had never spoken to her prior to this trip. When we got there, there were just way too many men in that room. And while she was silently serving us all tea in her apron, and I just wasn't going there. And she, um, she was on home detention with an ankle monitor. Gina Bisignano was on home detention with an ankle monitor. So some of the women who had done some more egregious things did have um, home detention but they were not in pre-trial, uh, they were not held in incarceration pre-trial. Um, and in fact, all of them, Tammy and Yvonne, all of them self-surrendered as well. Yeah. And Yvonne, Tammy only got 20 days. No, by the I think by the end of the documentary, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Yvonne hadn't gotten her surrender papers yet, so she but didn't she know when. Been, she, she didn't know when. That was September 21st. 2023 that that film or that that scene was filmed she had not gotten the letter yet when the letter did come she was to self-surrender to minnesota at the end of october and that's what happened well that is i can't i again i cannot i cannot express to you how much that that was not what i expected the, the documentary to be and it was <clears throat> Cause I would have probably got bored with it if it was just another J six. Cause I don't, you know, you know, I watched a bunch of them because sometimes you're up late at night and you're looking through Amazon prime yeah. and you're like, Oh, here's a, here's a J six. I haven't seen. And you're like, well, I kind of have actually, this is just like the last one. No, no right. shade on any of those people. They're the, the, you know, no. they do good work, but it was just, this was a different thing. This was, yes. it was like, it was like a, the, the road trip brought an interesting aspect to it because I think that there's a way in which it, kind of wears people out and will bring people's kind of will bring people's guard down in a way that could be unhealthy if you did it wrong but good, mm -hmm. good thing it was uh, you and liz there because it was fine um but i think it you know it, it it would it will break down some boundaries and stuff i guess the only other thing i really want to ask you is was there a difference between uh like 
when the camera was on versus like when you were filming and when you weren't for uh, either of the main subjects, uh, Yvonne or Tammy. No. So it there was, was no exactly yucking right it up. There's no yucking it up for the documentary. Nope. Not even a little bit. Huh? Nope. The one that we haven't talked about is the other character who ended up in there is Jill, who is the woman we stopped to see in Pennsylvania. Oh, the one who was going to start the revolution. Correct. And then, right. then they lost their venue and they couldn't, then they did it on zoom. We went to the Hampton Inn in Sharon, Pennsylvania, but the own whoever was supposed to book the room didn't book the room and it didn't happen. That's how we ended up going to see Rachel Powell instead. But, but keep in mind, Jill was a, is, is a psychiatric nurse practitioner licensed to prescribe medication in multiple states currently. Um, and she went down the rabbit hole in 2020, had never been political, had never heard of conspiracies, and fell into QAnon. And you see what happens. You saw what happened in the film. Uh, this is a licensed professional, educated, advanced degree. So I think what I also want to point out is Tammy, you know, is one end of the spectrum of the economic line. And Jill is more middle class. She's middle to upper middle class with an advanced degree. And Yvonne's kind of right in the middle. And so I think what's really been interesting to see is it really hit people across the spectrum of education, of class. Um, the only thing that was consistent was race. It was all white people. Uh, I've been asked, why, well, why didn't you have any women of color in here? Well, I studied the first 100 arrested and they were all white. So that's the answer to that. Right. I couldn't find oh. any. Right. right. I'm like, not like sure. Scientology, you can't, yet. you can't, you can't go around and interview black Scientologists because Scientology <laughs> white, like right, an Andrew exactly. Yang rally. Just like when I was at conscious life expo, it's again, women like me, um, so it's, you know, there's a, obviously the whiteness piece needs to be looked at uh, pretty carefully still. Um, and I do think there's a, uh, the generational piece is pretty significant also. And there's more research being done on that as well. Um, you, think, you know, we have this out. idea of like a midlife crisis and I'm just spitballing yeah. here, but do you, do you think there's a way in which there might be, and I know that a midlife crisis, it's not really a, a, a technical term. It's almost always about it's almost always an insulting term about a man but i just wonder if like some of the underlying psychology that leads a man to go buy a sports car or, you know that the tip the stereotypical leave you know buy a sports car and start dating his uh, administrative assistant or whatever yeah, exactly. if, if, if the like the underlying drive to remain relevant to remain cool or whatever is is at play i'm, I'm not a psychologist so it's hard but my observation no, I, like i'm wondering i'm you know my observation has been there's something to that, right? Because again, if you look, even at fem feminism has failed middle-aged women, right? Because if you fill out a, any woman who has ever filled out a questionnaire where you have to check the box for age, it goes up to like 49, like 30 to 49, and then it goes 50 plus. So they've lumped 50 to 90 together. Right, as like if you don't exist same. anymore. Because feminism has only concerned itself with equal earning power and reproductive rights. And that's pretty much it. Um, well, we're middle-aged. We're kind of past the prime of both of those things. So what's our purpose? Where's our space? And when pan the pandemic came along, it opened up a huge space for women, um, middle-aged women in particular. And there's something to the middle-aged thing. I've thought a lot about this um, on online. You know, we always talk about Gen Z being the first generation raised online, but it was us, the parents. It was, it was, it was, it was Gen X. Depending, it depends on you know who you were, what kind of household you were in, or whatever. But by the time I was eighteen, I had access to the. I'm not that much younger than I'm forty seven, and I had access You're to the internet every than. day, like with with no restriction. And so the Gen X, go. in a lot of ways, is actually the first internet generation. We didn't have it exactly. when we were kids, exactly. but as young adults, we had it. And yep, yep. And then we had to teach our children how to use it too. And, and I our remember in two thousand eight when I got Facebook for the first time. Seeing people from high school all of a sudden that I didn't like then and I don't particularly like now, I was like horrified when I would see people like, my husband cheated and are these spilling these personal details like, all what over. Are you doing? Right. Uh, but there's, there's something to that midlife crisis theory here, you know, or well, whatever we wonder, want to call it. You know, I wonder if, because like when I first got onto social media, I was throwing raves as like a profession. And I wonder right? if the fact that I saw social media as this, is this, I can print half as many flyers and reach 20 right. times as many local people right. phenomena versus this was my diary and my place to, you know, right. or, or whatever, whatever. I just wonder if I saw it as like a business, seeing it as a business opportunity, like sort of shielded some me of from some of the crazy. 
there were some of the women who were too old. They missed the mommy bloggers. Like they weren't the millennial mommy bloggers. They were too old for that by the time that became a thing. Right. Right. I was a former stay at home mom with three kids. I could have been, I would have loved to have gotten in on that mommy blogger thing, but I was too old by the point time I figured out what was going on. Right. And so there, there was this whole segment of these people who aren't, women are invisible at a certain age. And the internet gives you an opportunity to. You're invisible until you open her. your mouth and say something, some, maybe somebody looks like me doesn't like actually. What's that? You're invisible until you open your mouth and say somebody, something that somebody that looks like me doesn't like actually. Then, right. then, 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 then men, uh, men, men, a lot of straight men in my age cohort. Oh boy, they're boy howdy, they're going to see you, aren't they? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I can't, I can't wait till this. I can't wait till this comes out. What do, do we have a do we have a date for this, or are we not, not yet. sure yet? Um, we you know, the timing of it kind of sunk with it being complete this summer. Then not a lot happens in the summer, but. It has been submitted to premier rights festivals, and so we're kind of in a holding pattern until those right. decisions come out, uh, which should be in the next couple months, I would hope. Um, and then we're free to enter into other festivals. And so right now we've only had one screening, and it was a private screening at Occidental College because that's the only way we can do it right now. Uh, I mean, so I, if there's other people, if there's other opportunities for screenings before we get rejected or accepted, then we can do that. But so far, we I haven't. You know, we got through this election, and I haven't pursued it yet. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. I got to see it, and the people in my chat didn't. Nya, 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 nya. I think <laughs> one of the people in my chat did actually. Steps hanging out in there. So this, 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 yeah, this is great. I recommend everybody see it, and maybe after if it after it comes out, well, you know, maybe we can have you back on to kind of talk I'd about what to. it's like putting out putting out a film and going through the the, the you know, it's yeah. it's going to be fun, but it's going to be hard because the festival, the the, the yeah. festival, and the the you know the other the, like the independent film festival scene can be yeah. its own set of problems. And I'm writing a book too. I have a book manuscript due in January that will be published by 26, um, which goes into a lot more depth about these women's lives and how they got where they went. Oh, that that's great. That's great. We are, uh, we are, I am, this community is uh, fortunate to have you as one of our, uh, our, our uh, creative friends now. So well, thank you so much. Thank, uh, you for, I, thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, Steph, and I really appreciate Steph it. basically did that. She thank like, you, Steph. <laughs> you need to go on this guy's show. No, I had a lot of fun talking to you before this, and I had a lot of fun talking to you after this. I could have talked to you for three hours, but you and I both have this negative opinion of three hour interviews. So, so thank you. Yeah, make yourself a uh, cocktail or something non-alcoholic. Kick your feet up, and uh, I don't know if you're inclined. Maybe check out the rest of the show. We're going to be talking about your friend Chris Key. Exactly. I was like, <laughs> oh, he's my friend on my research account. I know all about this dude. <laughs> but uh, the research account is what uh, is what you call what we would call a sock, or I yes. might even call it a Correct. or maybe Correct. even a troll account. Yeah, it's not a troll account. It's not. No, I, 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 don't, a, I don't. I just lurk and ask questions. I don't. I think there's a huge difference between we have a couple different socks and and then we have I, uh, accounts that go in and make fun of people. I made my account and I use my account as if someone's going to figure out who it is. And I want to have the integrity that I have in my real life on my sock account too. Luckily enough, I came out of a, a group called the goat trolls and I mostly <laughs> just make fun of people who drink their own pee. So <laughs> my reputation is, is a, uh, I have a different kind of reputation to maintain. In any other space, in any other time that I wasn't actually trying to focus on an academic project, I would have been right there in your group. I promise <laughs> you. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is, this is, this has been fantastic. Uh, the, uh, the website is, uh, is that, pro uh, uh, I threw my piece of paper. Conspiracyfilm.com. Oh, conspiracy film. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, conspiracy. page 75 productions.com. You can find it there. And, uh, if you hit exclamation point guest in the chat, you can, uh, follow, follow the conspiracy film.com links to page 75. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, uh, there's, there's, uh, the trailer, you can watch the trailer again and we'll make sure to, we'll try to make sure to announce to everybody when it, when it comes out, I'm sure, Steph right. will, I'm sure Steph will make sure that I do. Yeah. <laughs> she's been the, she's been the best publicist ever. So <laughs> great. Well, Thanks. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I, I look forward to uh, chatting in the future. And I, if I have any, uh, mm -hmm. since you're doing a slightly different kind of work than I do, if I ever uh, need any, need any advice in, in the realm that I think you're in, you better bet I'll be hitting you up. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for taking the time. Everybody, we're going to take a real quick break. This has been a great interview. I recommend everybody check this movie out when it comes out and uh, follow Noel on Twitter. 
Um, oh, where is this thing? Um, or blue where, sky, <laughs> Twitter or, explodes. Uh, blue sky. I'll put the. I'll put. I only put the Twitter. The your blue sky link is in your Twitter profile, so yes, we're fine. Here. Exactly. We're gonna play a song called um, "Microwave Meltdown." Um, it has clips of David Pakman in it, and uh, I'll be back. I'll get a cocktail, and we'll make fun of Chris Key, who uh, will be drinking something other than a cocktail. <laughs> Thank thank you again. Thank you. The gap is getting wider day by day. Are U.S. government microwave mind control tests causing TV presenters' brains to melt down? Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy divertation tonight. We had a very Darrison bite. Let's go ahead, Paris Jason, let's for the bit. They had the pet. Microwave mind control tests 
causing TV presenters' brains to melt down. <laughs> Defense Minister McCain M McLeod did confirm today that more than 64 18 fighter jets are spending about as much as 20 and ready to as assist the 600 uh, 100 deployed over the amount needed. Now, we did depend that how the NOLAN emerges our end while the university or the UN m mission has all received support from all batteries in the queues of the, the gardens uh, of today. Excuse me, uh, I'll hand it back to you.